This is the 10th anniversary for Pi Swim. I'm going to give a little bit of a brief intro on the, the whole timeline of development. And I'm serving as the product manager for Pi Swim. And I do serve as the principal at Hydroinformatics LLC. Okay, so some of the motivation for this talk, I, I really want to present uh, the concept of Pi Swim and the story behind it and really highlight some of the, the latest research that has been built on top of Pi Swim. As far as the agenda, I'll give uh, information on um, some history of Pi Swim, the architecture, the critical features that have made it so powerful. It is used in a lot of different utilities right now in their real-time decision support frameworks. And then I'll talk more about our development community and philosophy and then finally some publication information. Um, as this project began, there was a certain number of problems that needed to be solved. And with SWIM as it was, they were really impossible um, to, to really take it a step further. For example, be it when I was working for MNET, we were really developing sophisticated control logic. And if anyone has ever done any control development in SWIM itself, it's its own esoteric programming language. It's complicated. It's, it's very hard to test because you actually have to run your models and do all kinds of things to to really validate the behavior of your controls, it's really difficult. We were looking for a means to have a simple interface to develop, to, to deliver hydrologic inflows and also correct inflows into the model. And so we we worked a lot of machine learning, uh, doing you know creating uh, neural network representations of of hydrology. One of the things that was helpful is having uh, being able to interact with a running simulation. Uh, that is makes sense for any coupling environment. And then automated KPI tools. We did a lot of work using evolutionary algorithms, tons of optimization. And when we're when you're running, a hundred thousand models it's really nice if if a model diverges so far from like a, an acceptable result that we can just exit early we can end the simulation so we can free up that compute and also yeah i mean there, there was a number of use cases that that we had but we we, we couldn't do with standard swim pi swim itself as i mentioned is a simple python wrapper around swim and inside of swim I'll show architecture in just a moment. Inside of SWIM, we developed a, a very extensive API, which has roughly, well, I think today it's probably around 80 entry points into SWIM. This is a full open source software project. It's maintained on GitHub and it's very flexible. It's community owned and it's it's been serving as the base library for intelligent infrastructure analysis, as well as real-time decision support systems that it would be for example a, a screen that a wet weather operations team would be looking at to manage their hydraulic network and high swim has been used in a lot of real-time applications for uh, doing data assimilation techniques as well as predictive analytics to give insight into what's coming down the pipe the the next bullet point i, I mentioned it's university and enterprise agnostic one of the things that we're really careful about is creating a space where this project does not look like it shows any favoritism to any sort of university or uh, enterprise. A lot of the funding for its initial development came from various universities, but also I think MNET had a really big role in, in driving the open source uh, push there. This, the whole concept here with when you wrap Python around SWIM, it enables all kinds of new possibility for interaction with SWIM. And we have like 150,000 open source libraries available for us to use in the Python package index, which really helps us to get to the answers really fast. We don't have to reinvent a new optimization framework. We don't have to do all these things because they just exist already. And a bit of the history, so back in 2012, when I was launching into my career, I was I was collaborating really heavily with US EPA. And by 2013, we decided what our API framework would look like. And so, as I mentioned, we're, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary, very excited about that. Around 2016, we started demonstrating control logic development in pure Python to control uh, gates and pumps and weirs within 
a simulation while it's running. So think about, I'll show some examples of this in a minute, but just think about the um, amount of opportunity that gives you. So now you can develop very sophisticated control logic. In uh, 2017, we released another version of PySwim where we were able to set the node inflow rate through the API. So we could then introduce hydrologic inflows with machi our machine learning method and our, our other proprietary methods of delivering flow to the model. Later on, between 2017 and 2020, many new developers showed up to the project. And then when we hit 2020, we released version one, which was uh, used simple wrapper interface generator, SWIG, which all of a sudden made the uh, project cross-platform and cross-architecture compatible. When uh, This year, we're, we're just about to release version two of PySwim, and this one is particularly exciting. There's a new entry point in Swim called Swim Stride. And what this allows you to do is discreetly control your analysis time step. So from a coupling standpoint, we can say we can want to interact with the simulation every 300 seconds uh, versus uh, we're, we're sort of, um, we, we don't have explicit control over that at the moment with PySwim. Um, so we, we were approximately 300 seconds or approximately 900 seconds. I could explain at a different time. So yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to this next release. It should be coming up in the next, um, maybe next month and a half or so. Uh, just a tiny bit on the community. Um, these, this is the most important part of an open source project. Um, we have Jennifer Wu up left. Uh, she worked for Xylem for quite a while. She was in my team. Um, Gonzalo is the next one over with the Hey. Uh, he used to be a developer for Anaconda, and he lived down in Colombia. Brooke Mason, she did a lot of API development and pollutants. Michael Tribby, Dr. Tribby, he works at US EPA. Uh, Catherine Ratliff, she's also a researcher at EPA, hydrology water quality analysis. And Caleb here, Caleb worked in my team for many years at Xylem, and now he actually works at EPA, also a developer on Swim with Michael. Next is Konstantin Karos. He's at Xylem. He's been a, a, a big push on kind of pushing PySwim 2 out, getting it going. And then we have the next one is Abhiram Lupudi. He's at Xylem, was a researcher at uh, University of Michigan and Bronco Kerkes' group. It's a really, really diverse team, really amazing group of people. The way that, that the community operates is on a meritocracy. Anyone can show up and, and contribute concepts and features. The recommend, normal recommendation is if you are interested in adding a feature, you raise an issue in the repository and we gather and we talk about it. Sometimes we have we have different meetings and then we would invite you to start contributing. And once you once you contribute, you'll be expected to present your code in a pull request, uh, present the applicable unit tests and regression tests, as well as the documentation as required. And so those are typical things that that we require um, to collaborate with the project. It's a bunch of like-minded individuals who are really excited about, you know, as I showed the, the slide earlier where I was introducing the team, really everyone's really positive and, and passionate about this field that we work in. And we really want to keep doing doing best, doing great for the, the clients that are using it and the, the utilities. And so the last and most important thing, as this does relate to saying this is, enterprise and university agnostic. There are no features inside of PySwim that are built to benefit only one person. So if somebody wanted to promote and add a feature that uh, something ridiculous, maybe multiply every number by negative one, you know, we're, we would never accept something like that. So, but if somebody wanted to develop a feature that, for example, introduced a way they could, they, if they wanted to build a new uh, LID, uh, analyzer and keep it separate from swim they needed to be able to pull out another piece of information to make that work we would enable that through api development and it would be a general feature so i think that that statement is one of the most important things about why this project has been so successful over the last decade because it's it's it shows 
we we have a lot of respect for keeping the product clean, light, and non non esoteric. Architecture, the core, as you could imagine, is Swim Five, and we've developed the expansive API on Swim. And then the next level here is a compiled version of Swim using Swig, Simple Wrapper Interface Generator, that creates basically a Python-based binary. And then we wrap it with a Pythonic feel. When you compile, when you compile, you know, a C API with with Swig, it's basically a list, it almost feels like a list of C functions. And inherently that is not Pythonic. It's important that that PySwim keep the feel of Python like every other Python uh, library. And just a brief example of what this would look like in practice. You have your standard imports and simulation and your links. We've put the simulation behind what's called the with context manager. And so then we create a handle to the simulation. This actually manages to open and close the simulation when you exit the with block. Uh, we instantiate a links object and pass our simulation handle to it. From there, we can then grab a link ID and we can set it to a variable. We can get, for example, various parameters out. It's, it's all in the documentation what's available, but like a flow limit or assert it as a conduit. And then when we enter this section, the four step in sim, now we're actually, and we've started our simulation and we're now stepping our simulation. And so we can, for example, print the flow rate, we can check the flow rate against a condition, and we can alter what like a target setting for a pump. So some of the critical features, as, as I explained, you can interact with the running simulation, and it's very easy Pythonic model coupling. Expanded API, so the high value entry points, set link target setting, set external inflow, set rain gauge rainfall rate you can set the outfall stage by the way these first four are very very helpful in doing data assimilation later on we added being able to set node pollutant concentration we have a lot of features in lid that allow you to well you you can now direct for example if you're building a drainage drainage method of LID, you can direct it to a different node or a different subcatchment during the simulation. And finally, the latest feature that we just added was the ability to save and use a hot start save a hot start file during any point in the simulation, and then it would be usable through the API once you wanted to restart a simulation. The value here is if if you're doing perhaps a model calibration and you your model's performing well, you can actually save a hot start file periodically, and then you can actually restart the simulation with different hydrologic parameters. There's gonna be a, somebody's uh, working on a paper that uses this now. Uh, we'll be hearing more about that in the next couple, maybe six months or so. I have a, these are a couple little examples. In this case, it's uh, using the set link setting. This is a, a, what's called a state machine on the left here. And in controls development, you develop a state machine. A state machine basically keeps the model in a certain state until an exit condition is met. And so this is a very trivial example, but I, what I'm trying to convey here is the fact that we are writing all of the control logic in Python. So why this is beneficial you can rapidly build and test a controller without a really complicated analysis. Like the way we used to do it inside of Swim is you would write your rules and then you would have to look at the Swim report file to see what control rule was triggered at what time. And it's it's easy when it's something simple like this, but when you get into the market-based control algorithm, it gets incredibly complicated. And so, here on the right, in this coded example, we're setting our step advance time, which again is the frequency we intend to interact with the simulation. We have a variable that is there to tell us whether we're in wet weather state or dry weather state. And so as we go through, as we enter our simulation, we'll check these conditionals. And if one of these becomes true, will enter that state and then that variable will be set and then 
we'll just since these are if else else if conditionals it'll exit the whole block and go to the next simulation time step from a um, industry standpoint this method of of building control has been so it, it expedited it so much it became so easy for us to to build and test the next one that is interesting was the set node external inflow and so um, in a basic example here, what I did is I, I'm, I created the, uh, an injection. So I wanted to inject flow into this node here and watch, watch what happened in the hydraulic grade line down here. The value here, as I mentioned before, is you can come up with your own hydrology methods and you're, you're not dependent on normal swim anymore. And this doesn't enable model coupling as well. And one of the neat features that this does allow is you can actually you can actually remove flow if you're working on, for example, a calibration method. You can actually pull flow out of the model, and mass balance is maintained all properly. So you can see in the time series here, there's there's an example of a before and after condition. Uh, oh, sorry, the lateral inflow is the flow getting injected directly into this node, and then the total inflow combines both the lateral inflow and the flow from upstream. So you can see here, what I did in this example at hour four, I started injecting 20 cubic feet per second, excuse me, feet per second. And the idea here was just to watch what happened in the downstream hydraulic grade line, which didn't change that much. This is uh, an example of, uh, one of one of the collaborators that we've had in this project. And this is, a, they have a machine learning method that they've used to essentially replace standard hydrology with machine learning. So they've done their own calibration here. And this is just a, a really applied, really good use case for set next uh, node external inflow. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing we're seeing more people move down the avenue of machine learning with hydrology. And these models are becoming so incredibly accurate. It, it, it's 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 beautiful. It's amazing. <laughs> It's not important to keep going with some of the details of, of those examples, but set rain gauge rainfall rate. You can imagine this is a really good thing to have in, in a predictive analytic environment. Set outfall stage. So if you are if you're trying to use a data assimilation technique, this is this is a really powerful feature. A setting node pollutant concentration, we do have a we've we, we've worked with uh, University of Michigan, and they've developed a water quality, uh, it, like a plug-in for Pi Swim, which allows them to perform a treatment analysis at certain nodes. Lastly, like I said, we have LID unit drain node control. And then, as I also mentioned, Swim Stride is going to be upgraded in Pi Swim 2.0 to use the explicit explicit C function to advance the model forward by a, a target amount of time. I should say one other thing, as we talk and present this, PySwim project, it really encompasses the three layers as I presented in the architecture diagram, meaning we really call the whole family of code bases PySwim. So if we wanted to, um, if, if you're interested in wrapping the C functions explicitly, then you you could do that. We would still call it PySwim, but it, it, it's, it's one and the same. The features are there for whatever level of abstraction you want. If you're if you're developing your code base in C and interested in coupling, then it would make sense to talk to the C entry points. Right now, uh, if you Google Scholar us, we 175 hits, and we did publish a paper just a couple of years ago. And there's a, a bunch of a bunch of researchers that are using this in various contexts all around the world. And it's, it's been really exciting to see it grow. So I have several training resources available. We have our normal website. I've got a, a whole YouTube channel here. On the website, we have examples. And it, really, all this is just Googleable, but I do have the links persisted here if, if anyone's interested. 